Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn, Jill Robbins, and John Russell. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present the next part in our series on America's presidents. But first, the coronavirus pandemic left makers of personal computers, smartphones, and cars without the computer chips needed to make their products. That suddenly changed during a period of three weeks from late May to June. High inflation, China's latest COVID restrictions, and the war in Ukraine have reduced consumer spending, especially on computers and smartphones. Chip shortages turned into a surplus in some industries. By late June, memory chip company Micron Technology Incorporated said it would reduce production. The sudden change in the market caught Micron by surprise, said Chief Business Officer Sumit Sadana. Worries about an industry recession have severely affected computer chip stocks. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index has fallen 35% so far in 2022. That is far more than the S&P 500's 19% loss. Hoarding is making the situation worse. Hoarding is the practice of collecting or storing a large amount of something. Many manufacturers stored a large number of computer chips during the pandemic. Before that, those manufacturers ordered parts as close to production time as possible to avoid having extra supplies and to reduce storage space and spending. Experts say the computer chip surplus has hit unevenly across business areas. Big suppliers of chips to electronics makers will be hit hardest by the decline, said semiconductor expert Tristan Guerra. Computer chip design company NVIDIA Corporation could be hit especially hard as prices continue to fall, Guerra added. NVIDIA produces graphic chips used for gaming and the digital money known as cryptocurrency. Among those least affected by a surplus are Apple Incorporated's suppliers like Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, said computer chip expert Matt Bryson. Demand remains high for Apple devices. Industry executives and experts cannot say how many surplus chips are in storerooms around the world. But industry expert Mark Lapassus said supply numbers for the first three months of 2022 hit a record high at major electronics manufacturing services companies. The earlier record was over 20 years ago. Manufacturers may decide to use up chips in storerooms instead of buying new ones and cancel orders, Lapassus warned. Some experts said automobile chip makers are safe for now. But that may not last long. Industry expert Stacy Rascon told Reuters that automakers were ordering far more chips than they appeared to need. That will create a problem when vehicle makers stop buying chips to use up their current supplies. Researchers have begun a new search in the United States for the mysterious material known as dark matter. Scientists believe dark matter makes up most of the mass of the universe. 
but they have not yet directly observed the material. Astronomers have theorized that dark matter exists because of gravity's observed effects on galaxies and groups of galaxies. The search is happening in a former gold mine in the Midwestern state of South Dakota. The experiment aims to isolate dark matter inside a tank that is about one and one-half kilometers underground. Scientists have designed the experiment to block out nearly all cosmic rays and particles believed to move through our world every day. The hope is that by blocking these materials, dark matter particles will show up in the isolation tank. The experiment, called Lux Zeppelin, is being carried out in the Sanford Underground Research Facility. If it succeeds, the team said, dark matter will produce a reaction involving the element xenon. The researchers said dark matter would produce a flash of light and be seen by a device called a time projection chamber. Scientists recently announced that the five-year, $60 million search effort finally got started after delays caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Members of the search team said the device has not yet identified dark matter. But the equipment does appear to be keeping out most of the background radiation the researchers had hoped to block. To search for this very rare type of interaction, job number one is to first get rid of all the ordinary sources of radiation, which would overwhelm the experiment, said project member Carter Hall. He is a physicist at the University of Maryland. The researchers said they expect only a few signs of dark matter to appear a year. The team of 250 scientists estimates the operation will produce 20 times more data in the future. During the experiment, the chance of finding dark matter with the device is probably less than 50 percent, but more than 10 percent, said Hugh Lippincott. He is a physicist and spokesman for the project. Kevin Lesko is a physicist at the U.S. Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in Berkeley, California. He told the Associated Press that finding dark matter is far from a sure thing. But Lesko said the scientists need a little enthusiasm to keep going. You don't go into rare search physics without some hope of finding something. Another team member Physicist Aaron Manalese explained the importance of xenon to the experiment. He said the element will permit researchers to see whether particle collisions that happen in the tank hit a xenon electron or its nucleus. If something hits the nucleus, it is more likely to be the dark matter that everyone is looking for, Manalese said. I'm Brian Lynn. The U.S. government has agreed to a request from environmental groups to study increasingly important habitats for North Pacific right whales. The animals are among the rarest whales in the world. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, fisheries estimates there are about 30 North Pacific right whales left in the world. Centuries of hunting, ship strikes, and entrapment in fishing equipment 
have badly harmed the species. They have been listed as endangered since 1973. In 2008, NOAA declared two areas in the northern Pacific Ocean as critical habitats for the whales. One area is about 3,043 square kilometers in the Gulf of Alaska. The other is 91,841 square kilometers in the southeast Bering Sea. Two groups, the Center for Biological Diversity and Save the North Pacific Right Whale, are asking the agency to increase the protected areas by connecting them. NOAA said in a statement that this would increase the Bering Sea boundary west and south. The proposal would also extend the critical habitat area off Alaska's Kodiak Island east to the Gulf of Alaska to include new feeding grounds. The Center for Biological Diversity said these feeding grounds for the whales were confirmed by new research. Kristen Carden is a scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity. She said in a statement, Safeguarding the North Pacific right whale's habitat is crucial to protecting these magnificent animals. NOAA Fisheries said the extended habitat would include productive fishing areas and paths that many ships take. But it also would include places where the large whales have been seen and heard. The environmental groups said in their request to NOAA that physical and biological features in the proposed critical habitat require special considerations and protections. They may include placing speed limits on ships. Kevin Campion is with the Save the North Pacific Right Whale Group. He said the proposal is a step in the right direction for making sure these animals get to exist on the planet. I'm Jill Robbins. Think about a time that you wanted to talk about a movie. How did you describe it? In today's Everyday Grammar, we will use a reader's message to explore how to talk about a movie. We will consider three questions. What is the movie about? What did the main character think or do? How did the film affect you? In a recent report, we asked our listeners and readers to send us a message describing a movie. Esra, in Turkey, wrote about the movie In Time. Here is part of what Esra wrote about the film's subject matter. Its topic was unequal income distribution. They were using time to buy things. For example, if you want to get on the bus, then you had to give a certain amount of your lifetime for it. Our first suggestion is to consider another structure to describe the subject of the movie. Esra wrote, Its topic was unequal income distribution. While the structure, its topic was, is fine, there is another structure that English speakers often use, is about plus noun or noun phrase. For example, what is that movie about? The movie is about... The past tense is fine, too, as in the movie was about. So Esra could have written about in time... The movie was about inequality. Note that we used inequality instead of unequal income distribution. Although inequality's meaning is a bit broader, English speakers often use it in the sense of economic or financial inequality. We might change the remainder of Esra's description to something like this. People used time to buy things. For example, if a person wanted to get on the bus, then they had to pay with a certain amount of their life. In this case, we use the pronouns they, their because it is a very general description that refers to a person whose gender is not known. Esra went on to explore another important issue, the thinking of the people in the film. 
Its main star was thinking everyone should be equal, and rich should distribute time between everybody. We suggest changing star to character. A character is a person who appears in a movie, book, or play. The most important character is known as the main character. We also suggest changing was thinking, a verb form known as the past continuous, to thought, the simple past. This is because we often use the past continuous to set up another action, as in the main character was thinking about how to escape when his phone rang. We could change Esra's sentence to something like this. The main character thought everyone should be equal. A few more details could be added in, as in... The main character thought everyone should be equal in terms of how time was distributed. Esra did not describe the movie in terms of special effects or cinematography. Rather, Esra described the film in terms of the film's ideas that explored human life, economy, and society. What attracts me to the movie was it looked very similar to our world. Aren't we give our time to earn money? We suggest using a consistent verb form, either present or past. The past tense form could be... What attracted me to the movie was that it looked very similar to our world. The question that Esra asked could involve the helping verb do instead of be, as in... Don't we give our time to earn money? This question suggests that the film's effect was that it forced Esra to think about time, money, and how people spend their lives. Please note that there are different ways to describe the effects of a movie. You can tell about how a movie made you think by using The movie made me, or It struck me that, as in The movie made me think about our world. The movie made me reconsider my life and how I spend my time. Or It struck me that the movie was similar to our world. The next time you describe a movie, try to do so by answering the following questions. What is the movie about? What did the main character think or do? How did the film affect you? This is not the only way to describe a film, but it is a useful way to begin a discussion or to make other people interested in the movie. Let's end this report with homework. Take a film and answer the three questions about it by using some of the structures and words that you learned today. Write us in the comments section of our website, learningenglish.voanews.com, or send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. I'm John Russell. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Martin Van Buren. He was sworn in as the eighth president of the United States in 1837. Van Buren had already been working for the White House for several years. He had been the Secretary of State for President Andrew Jackson and later his vice president. Jackson asked his party, the Democrats, to nominate Van Buren as their presidential candidate in the 1836 election. They agreed, and Van Buren won that election easily. But he did not win the next election, or the next, or the next. In his inaugural speech in 1837, Van Buren noted that he was the first U.S. president to be born after the American Revolution, he was also the first president who was not from a British family. His ancestors were Dutch. He remains the only president, so far, who did not speak English as his first language. In his inaugural speech, 
Van Buren predicted better times for Americans. But several days later, an economic crisis struck. The situation put the country in a depression that lasted for the rest of Van Buren's term. It was one reason the president's opponents called him Martin Van Ruin. The Depression was not Van Buren's only problem. He also faced a dispute with Britain related to the border between the U.S. and Canada. The conflict nearly turned into war. Historian Joel Silby says most experts do not think Van Buren was a strong president. However, Silby notes, Van Buren left an important legacy that still operates today. He created the modern U.S. political system. Van Buren's political education began early. His father was a farmer and operated a hotel at a small town in New York State. Lawmakers sometimes visited the hotel. By listening to them, the future president learned about politics. Eventually, Van Buren studied in a law office and became a lawyer. In the first years of his career, he defended farmers who were fighting large plantation owners for their land. As a result, he developed a reputation for helping the common man. Van Buren became a local official, and then a senator, and governor of New York. When he was 24, he married a young woman he had grown up with, but she died of tuberculosis after 12 years, leaving him with four sons. Historian Joel Silby says, although Van Buren did not remarry, he was known as quite charming among the ladies. Van Buren had a gift for politics, that is, developing relationships and forming alliances. Historian Joel Silby says, most people who knew Van Buren liked him. He seemed warm and friendly. He tried to keep his work-related life and social activities separate. It was not unusual to see him exchange handshakes, smiles, and jokes with men who were his political enemies. His ability to make friends became a powerful tool. Before Van Buren, even lawmakers from the same political party operated independently. They had their own beliefs, their own supporters, and their own allies. Van Buren brought them together. First, he identified people who followed the ideas of Thomas Jefferson, support for independent farmers and states' rights. The group had become known as the Democratic Party, although it was in many ways different from the Democratic Party of today. Van Buren organized meetings for Democrats to talk about their political beliefs. He persuaded them to support the same policies, at that time the policies of Andrew Jackson. Sometimes Van Buren helped people who supported Jackson's policies. He gave them government jobs. Van Buren also used a series of meetings to choose one presidential candidate for the party. If this process seems clear-cut, it was not at the time. During the election of 1824, for example, a single party had four separate candidates for president, one for each part of the country. Van Buren's system eventually gave rise to the national conventions that major U.S. parties use today to nominate their candidates. Van Buren also helped create the modern political campaign. In the 1820s, he saw that many state constitutions were lifting some of their voting restrictions. As a result, states were giving more white males the right to vote. Women, and most African American men, were still largely prohibited from voting. Historian Joel Silby says, Van Buren wanted to bring the new voters into the Democratic Party. He decided to improve on the methods that other, smaller groups had used. Campaign events, speeches, and organized efforts to bring people to vote on Election Day. Silby explains that these efforts to persuade and energize voters were new to national politics. 
Now they are some of the major features of political campaigns. In the election of 1840, Van Buren sought a second term as president. This time, his opponents used Van Buren's political techniques against him. Silby says the new opposition party, called the Whigs, used popular speeches and events to portray Van Buren as a failed president. Crowds shouted, Matty Van is a used-up man. In other words, he no longer had any power or effect in government. Critics also made fun of Van Buren's fine-looking, even fussy clothes. They portrayed him as a rich, elite candidate. They compared him unfavorably to their candidate, a military hero named William Henry Harrison. Yet it was Van Buren who had come from a poor family and Harrison from a wealthy one. Even so, Van Buren lost the election of 1840. Four years later, Van Buren again sought the presidency. This time, even Andrew Jackson did not support him. Instead, Jackson backed a man who supported the seizure of Texas and expanding slavery, James Polk. But Van Buren did not permit those defeats to stop his political career. He ran again in the presidential election of 1848. This time, Van Buren withdrew from the Democratic Party he had helped build. He ran instead as the candidate of a new anti-slavery party called the Free Soilers. But even Van Buren's political skills could not persuade voters. He did not win a single state. After losing this final presidential election, Van Buren finally retired. He spent time with his children and grandchildren, traveled, and wrote about his life. At 79, he died of heart failure. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 